that your heart and mind will uh, certainly progress into that. And um, pray that it'll be a blessing to you. By the way, uh, again, for those of you that are interested, I've already got my Christmas list ready to go. If you want to see that and buy me some Christmas gifts, uh, you're welcome to go with that. And um, just kind of get you on the head start there. And uh, hopefully you'll do well, okay? Are you, are you glad to be here this morning? You're lethargic. I'm not sure what's going on. I know what's going on. Yeah, Thanksgiving comatose. I know what's going on. And I, again, I'm glad you're here. Let's get right to it. How about Luke chapter 2? We've got to talk about the Lord a little bit. That's what we do at church. Talk about the Lord. And uh, so I want to share his word with you. I want to bring to you a thought, real simple thought. And that is uh, that uh, I must. I must. We don't deal well with absolutes. We, um, we just really don't process those things too well when ultimatums, if you will, are given. We tend to kind of bow the neck, don't we? We, we tend to, uh, and by the way, there are, I definitely would say there are good ultimatums and bad ultimatums, right? Um, but when, when we feel like we're being pressed into something or that, you know, a, a hard line is being drawn, we, we tend to um, kind of bow back a little bit, especially if those lines are being, we feel, pressed upon ourselves. We just don't like that. Well, you know, when the law says drive 35, what do you do? You drive 36, right? At least. By the way, uh, I know many people, I know many good Christian folk, <clears throat> not me included, take the speed limit as a mere suggestion. <laughs> Can I get a testify on that from somebody? Amen. Amen. The idea of absolutes, we tend to kind of press the limits, don't we? It's amazing. Uh, kids will press the limits, won't they? You tell them this is it. And they push the limits, and of course, when they cross over, a lot of mom and dads are like, okay, now, now this is the new it. Right? And now, no, no, this is the new it. Right? And we tend to try to move the lines at times, and we, uh, we just don't like ultimatums. Matter of fact, I would say that it's, it's really our flesh, right? Our, our flesh doesn't like to be hemmed in. We, we don't like uh, to be, you know, in a sense, put in a box. And having our life kind of pressed upon, if you will. And the beauty of God is that where the world sees it as hard lines and your life is being, you know, thwarted and, and pressured, what we discover in the Christian life is not the hard lines of God pressuring us into something we don't want to be. We actually discover the freedom that's in Christ. Amen. Amen. And that beauty of enjoying the Christian life, absolutes, hard lines, we... Uh, by the way, can I just tell you something? I, 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 um, the flesh doesn't like it. Anything you tell the flesh not to do, it wants to do just the opposite. And I don't care how spiritual you are. Uh, you give your flesh one ounce of opportunity, it will press those lines and do its best to cross over those lines and move on to something else. And, and let me go ahead and say something here. Uh, it's kind of the way our world exists, right? Our world resists that. And uh, anytime you put those limits, uh, they tend to buck all that. And matter of fact, the world tends to champion the idea that there are no hard lines. The world tends to kind of say, well, we don't really want absolutes. We don't believe in absolutes. We don't think that there are any particular hard lines. And by the way, let's come up with one really clear hard line of God uh, that, that no man comes unto the Father but by me. That's a pretty hard line. That's a pretty clear, absolute, I am the way, the Lord would say, and the truth and the life, and no man comes unto the Father but by me. And so the concept, again, of God beginning to draw some hard lines. Here's another one for you, by the way, that, yes, Christians need to acknowledge and accept that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Father. By the way, that's not a suggestion. That's an absolute. I mean, if you're not, if you want to experience real spiritual Christian godly life, then the only way to do that is to be sustained by the very word of God. And so it's not a suggestion. It's not an idea that, well, just try it out. And if you don't like it, go do something else. That's not it at all. God said you, the only way to live and the only way to have life is to sustain yourself with the words that come out of the mouth of God. You agree with that or not? Now, now again, I don't know whether you see that as an absolute or a hard line or maybe a, just a suggestion. I, I fear 
that a lot of times Christians maybe see that one as a bit of a suggestion. And because we tend to kind of push the limits at times. The thing is, and I find this in, in Luke chapter 2. Do you know the story in Luke chapter 2 towards the end of the story, or towards the end of the chapter rather? It's the story of Mary and Joseph going to Jerusalem, right, to, to tend to their business, the Passover I think it was. And, and of course the Lord now is about 12 years old. How many of you are familiar with the story? All right, maybe some of you are not. The story goes that as they, with probably many others at the time, it was required for them to journey from Nazareth to Jerusalem for the feast and, and for other reasons. And so while they're in Jerusalem, Jerusalem fills to capacity. I mean, you talk about, you know, you talk about Black Friday shopping. I mean, you talk about fill to capacity. And um, there, as a matter of fact, they, they say that, that maybe Jerusalem would go from maybe 50,000 to over 300,000 in just a matter of days. And so it just swells. And so caravans of people from all over the areas, all over, from every direction would come. And of course, after the Passover, after the feast was over, they would caravan back home. You know the story, right? As they make their way, their journey back to home, it's discovered that Jesus is not in the caravan. Classic case, at least I think, of mom thinking dad's taking care of the 12 year old, and dad thinks mom's taking care of the 12 year old, and probably they both wish the 12 year old would just take care of himself. And in all respects, he is. He's left in Jerusalem. They return to the city, and I don't know how long they searched. Maybe their search was short. The Bible says they found him where? In the temple. The Bible says, and it's an incredible thing, it says that he was asking questions and he was giving answers. A display of our Savior's wisdom and power and, and all the things on display, uh, again, of our Savior. And both asking questions, giving answers, and they were astonished at his doctrine. That they couldn't believe that a little 12-year-old guy, you know, could, could do what he was doing. And, of course, Mary comes in, and if you put a father and a mother, you know, humanity to it, she comes in and she's like, where have you been? What are you doing? Do you not know that me and dad have been, you know, stressed to the limit. It took us a whole day on the fastest camel we had to get back to Jerusalem. What are you doing? Now, that's putting humanity to it. I don't know how much Mary understood. I don't know. You know, but on the other hand, maybe Mary's thinking, well, you know, you are Jesus. You know, you're not like little Johnny across the street, you know. He's a, never mind. You know, you, you are Jesus, and of course, nonetheless, it's not okay, you know, for you not to be where you're supposed to be. And what did Jesus say to his mother Mary at that moment? Wish ye not that I must, that I must be about my father's business. Hard lines are drawn. What if your 12-year-old said to you, I must do this, not what you say. Uh, I remember, a uh, matter of fact, one of the things I'm kind of astonished at a little bit in our day and age today uh, with, you know, in society is the concept that, that a child doesn't, um, oh, help me, Lord, with this one. That, that the child is, seems to be on an equality with mom and dad. And it's almost like there's negotiations first about authority and then about behavior. Uh, by the way, um, uh, if, if my child, again, my children are, are pretty much all here and, and they're grown, they're adults. But I know when I was, you know, when I was a young parent, if my son had come to me and said, you know what, dad, I, I'm going to go do this, not what you say. I'm going to tell you right now, it would not have gone well. Can I get a testimony to that? Yes. It just wouldn't have gone well. I don't care if they said, well, Dad, we're going to go save the world. I do not care about saving the world right now. You were going to do what I say. Right? We draw hard lines in the sense of obedience. 
We have this kind of this quandary of thought where we have this 12 year old Jesus that that is telling his mom, I must do this. I mean, this is this is why I'm here. My father's a business. I must. And we find <laughs> we actually find where Jesus went home to Nazareth. Uh, Mary and Joseph said, <laughs> again from the human, I don't care about your father's business. Get on the camel. <laughs> You're going, huh? We'll deal with dad's business later. You're only 12, for goodness sakes. And again, this idea begins to play itself out. The Bible, the Bible says there in Luke chapter 2, about verse 51 or so, that he grew in wisdom and stature and favor among all men. 50, 51, 52, somewhere right in there. The concept of our Lord as it begins to grow, one thing that's on full display, I think, is even at 12 years old, is our Savior's knowledge and understanding of what his life was about. By the way, there, there's a simple, a very simple principle in this issue that comes around every year. We call it Christmas, is the idea that God's plan was to save the world from sin. Can I get an amen for that? And the idea that we would celebrate it year in and year out and to realize that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. See, the father's business comes into full display. The father's business was really simple, have a plan to save the world. I'm glad, I'm glad God saved the world, didn't leave it up to us. By the way, uh, I, I just think it's silly. Uh, I... I just think it's silly, the whole concept about global warming. By the way, I think it's been global warming since I've been born. <laughs> Can I get an amen on that one? Well, what if uh, there's a meteorite, you know, six billion light years away, and man, if it hits the earth, it's a global killer. Well, God is still in control. Can I get an amen on that? I mean, there is no meteorite in the heavens of God's creation that is going to hit the earth by which God doesn't determine it to hit the earth. And I'll be honest with you, if it's going to hit the earth, I hope it hits my house. <laughs> hit my house. I don't want to survive. You know, if it's a global cure, let's just get it over with. And the idea of the father's business, that he would have a plan to save the world, and that the plan would include the giving of a son. I mean, what other, what other price tag is there that's good enough to satisfy holy God's demands for sin? But can I say this to you as well, that the Father's business would include you and I? See, when you start discovering about the must, I must be about my father's business, the idea that the business of God includes those to share the news and the plan of God for the entire world. And ultimately, you and I are included. See, the, when the Lord said, I must, it, it's imperative. It's the idea that it's, it's an urgent situation. And, and, and the must also includes that it's a woven into being binding upon our life. In other words, the Lord didn't come to the earth just to live. I mean, it's bound in the life of our Savior that he would ultimately go and accomplish the Father's business and die on Calvary. There's no other reason for God to become flesh unless he is dying on Calvary. So when the Lord said, I must be about my father's business, the Lord indicated an incredible plan. It included a plan to save the world and it included the plan to give his only begotten son to be the measure of that saving of the planet, if you will. And at the same time, it's woven into our Savior in such a way that my life can be about nothing else. Nothing else. Now, when you, we don't have any more information, by the way, about the Lord from 12 until he shows up in about Luke chapter 3, I think it is, Luke 3 or 4 when he's 30. 18 years of life go by and we don't have a thing. The only thing we can understand a little bit is the fact that somewhere during that time, matter of fact, it might have started about the age of 12 in Jewish culture, that it'd be learned how to be a carpenter. He learned how to 
follow his father's business and learn the skills of carpentry and all the things that went with that. We can imagine that as a young man, he learned not only the skills, but he probably went to work helping provide and take care not only of himself, but probably his family, that he was probably skilled in building houses and furniture and cabinetry and knickknacks and everything else. We can imagine that our Savior was an obedient son during those years because the Bible says that he was without sin. Amen. Can you imagine being college age and have no sin? Well, we had a conversation, and I think this is so true, just a little side thought. I honestly believe that the university life is the absolute most toxic place on earth when it comes to God. Absolutely. By the way, you teenagers really understand something that when you decide to go off to college, if you don't have your feet underneath you as a Christian, university is going to do everything to take it away from you. If you don't love God now as a teenager, your chances of loving God when you get through college are next to Neil. Not little Neil, just Neil. You with me on that? The concept that they would steal that away from us. And here's our Savior going through these very years, seemingly inconsequential, seemingly hidden away from life. But the Lord, when the Lord shows up back in, when he's 30 years old, it's in John chapter 1, right? Where, where John the Baptist you know, points to me, behold, the Lamb of God, this is the one I'm going to die on Calvary. And the Lord, I think the Lord would say, although the scripture doesn't give it to us, the Lord would say, hey, I am here to fulfill my Father's business. I'm here to get it done because it's a must. It's woven into my very being. It's binding. It's binding in our life question for you, what must you do? What must you do? I've got a, uh, I think about all the things that I feel like I must do. I got a, I've got a desk in my garage, my, my workshop that I've been working on. I'm trying to build myself a desk. I have hit a bit of a snag. It's called just want to. <laughs> By the way, the desk looks amazing. It's just not much of a desk right now. And I go out there in my garage, and man, that thing looks awesome. But I ain't, I'm not working on it today. My wife's looking at me like, when are you going to get the desk done? Matter of fact, I've got 42 other projects we want to work on. I walked out of my, actually I was gone for Thanksgiving, came home uh, Friday night late, and um, drove in my driveway, and my, my driveway just cracked and popped. There are a billion leaves in my yard. By the way, does anybody else not like leaves? So I got a really simple solution. I got a big blower and I'm blowing my neighbor's yard. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I must go home and do something about the leaves and the pine needles in my yard. Is it a must? Is it, am I bound to that idea? Now maybe I must go to work tomorrow. How many of you have had the week off? Two days off? How many of you work? <laughs> Do you work? <laughs> How many of you are retired? Anybody retired? Wow, look at you people. Wow. Praise the Lord for you. Teenagers, you know what all that means? You guys got to get a job. You know, we're going to work. <laughs> oh, the idea of tomorrow going back to work. I know some of you just can't wait to go back to work tomorrow. You must go back to work. I don't care what the turkey says. The concept that we feel bound, binding, I must. Our, our Savior says, I must. See, the Father's business is something that really is a bit of a challenge in our own life because here's the ultimate question. Whatever the, whatever the issues in life that we demand of our children, the one thing as a parent we must remember is that whatever the premier issue is, it must ultimately be about being loving and loving God in their Christian walk. Amen. In other words, I can have my kids clean your room, but we all know tomorrow is going to need cleaning again. Clean the house. I'm sick of cleaning the house. I'm sick of picking up leaves. I haven't even picked any up yet. 
All right, there are things that we have to do that we're going to have to continue to do. But when it comes right down to it, there's one thing that must be bound in the heart of every person who claims Christ as Savior. It's not the cleaning of the yard or the cleaning of the bathroom or picking up your room. It is that you must learn to be bound to the, to the business of the Father. Thought I might get a bigger amen on that. See, the business of the Father, we're still doing the business of the Father. Let's take a look. Let's take a look. Because it's an interesting view of what we must do as Christians and what we are still about today. And, and the challenge for us as we go into Christmas season, as we go into 2020, as we continue to blaze a trail through history, you know, as we continue to kind of set the tone, where as a Christian, as a church, we need to kind of say, this is who we are. This is what we are about and we are about the Father's business. Let's take a look. The Bible springboards. By the way, it's out of verse 49. Where's my Bible? It's verse 49 where we find the verse, right? Wish you not it must be about my Father's business. Don't you know? Don't you understand? Don't you see? Don't you perceive that I must be about the Father's business? And the business of the Father begins to unfold a story. In other words, what the Lord is saying at 12 is, there's something bound in my life that's so much bigger than just this moment, Mom. It's more than, than just here asking a question and giving an answer. It's more, it's bigger rather than the location of whether I'm in Jerusalem or in your, on your camel or in your wagon or in Nazareth. It's bigger than that. The binding of God's plan. It's necessary. And the Lord, from the very beginning, here's what I thought was interesting. The Lord seemed to be surprised at 12 that his mom didn't understand. Again, another question that kind of the Lord hit me with this week. He's like, Andy, do you understand what's bound in your heart? Do you really understand what, what binds you to life itself and what the business is? and what the focus ought to be. And so we consider how this unfolds in the must uh, of, of our Savior, but how it unfolds in our own life. Consider a couple of things. The Lord said in John chapter 9, I'm going well, to walk you through the scripture. If you can hang with me, hang with me. John chapter 9, the story is about the blind man. The disciples asked the Savior, now which one sent? His parents or him that he's blind. And the Lord said, neither. And his mom and parents or his mom and dad didn't sin. It's not about that. And it's not about his sin. Matter of fact, he's blind, but the glory of the Father must shine through it. He says, I, even today, while it is day, I must work the work of him that sent me. While it is day, I must work the work of him that sent me. The Father's business requires that there is an urgency to the issue. And he said, I must. Same word as in Luke chapter 2. All of these references I'm going to give to you is the same concept of being bound to something. God said, the Lord said, I am bound to do the work of him that sent me. It is the Father's business. And while it is day, we must get it done to bring glory unto the Lord. Mark chapter 13, verse 10, it says the gospel first must be published among all nations. The gospel first must be published among all nations. It is bound in the plan of God that the entire world hear about the gospel of Christ and the plan of God. By the way, are we thankful today that we've heard the gospel? I would love to be able to track my spiritual heritage. And I'm not talking about, you know, the ones who led certain, certain people to Christ. My mom was the one instrumental, really my parents, but it was my, my, uh, my father. Uh, it was his pastor, Brother Spencer, at um, Central Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Illinois, that preached the night my dad got saved as a 17-year-old teenager, run down to the altar and, and got saved. Actually ran out of the choir during the, during the invitation, accepted Christ at the altar as a 17-year-old young man. 
But I would love to understand who it was that shared the gospel with Brother Spencer. And I would love to understand who it was that shared the gospel with that person and that person and that person because the Lord says it is the Father's business and it is a must that the gospel be preached among all nations. Where would we be today without the Lord? I have no concept of where I would be. I probably wouldn't be here. But where would America be as a nation if it wasn't founded on the gospel of Jesus Christ? Amen. America's not perfect, but when God said it's the work of the Father, it is the work, and the gospel must be preached. It's abound in the plan of God. Luke 4, 43, the Lord says, I must preach the gospel to, of the kingdom. The kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. Repent, believe ye, accept Christ as the Savior. It's the gospel of of the kingdom, accept Christ as your master. Accept him, it's the gospel of the kingdom. It's the gospel message of Christ being the savior. By the way, last I read in the scripture, God's plan includes that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance, amen. It's bound in the plan of God. And it was bound in the heart of our Savior. I must get this done. Luke twenty two thirty seven 37 says, The things written of me must be accomplished. The things must be accomplished in me. He was of numbered among the transgressors. The Bible makes it very clear that the things written about our Savior, they must be accomplished. In other words, there's no going to the cross of Calvary without bearing the sins of the world. Amen. Do you understand? I know we do. We've heard this a thousand times, but the reality is it's bound in the heart of God. It's bound in the heart of our Savior. And the Lord says, the things written of me must be accomplished. He was numbered among the transgressors. By the way, stop for just a moment. I want you to reflect on your sin. I want you to reflect on your sin. Your sin is not to be compared to anybody else. In other words, it's not whether you're better or worse than your spouse, husband, wife, whether or not you're better or worse than your children or your parents, right? Your cousins, your uncles, your aunts, your, your other church people. I mean, some of us have some incredible testimonies. Amen. Let me rephrase that. All of us have incredible testimonies. Because the fact of the matter, no matter what your sin, here you go, you ready for this? No matter where you came from, our Savior, the Bible says, it was written among Him to be numbered among the transgressors that He took your sin to Calvary for you. That's the story. I think about my sin. I think about the times that I've lied to my parents growing up. Evil thoughts that I've had in my life. Terrible things of behavior I won't even discuss with you. Attitudes that are prevalent in my life. Things of pride, feeling I was better. Some years ago, I had one of those occasions where I met and saw an old classmate from junior high. His name was Mike. Mike was a big guy. He was... Even in eighth grade, he was, had to be six feet tall. And he probably weighed, even at that time, probably 250 pounds. He was a big boy, played football. And I was glad because I played quarterback. He was a big boy. And I saw him several years ago now. We were junior high classmates. Random happen chance meeting. And I recognized him, Mike. And he looks at me with a straight face. He goes, hi, Andy. And we're talking 25 years after the fact. And I said, Mike, it's good to see you. How, you know, what are you up to nowadays? I, well, I'm doing this and doing that. And you know what he told me that day? <laughs> 25 years after the fact, he said, you used to make fun of me. And I was like, Mike, of course, like we always do. Well, really, me? I, I mean, I didn't make fun of you. I didn't do that. He goes, no, you used to make fun of me for being big. 
Voilà. <laughs> you know what I told him? I said, Mike, Lord have mercy. That was dumb. That was wrong. You with me? See, some of the sins we kind of overlook at times. We think, well, not a big idea. God took that to the cross. He was numbered among the transgressors, not because of his own sin, but because of yours and mine. And what was written of him, he must suffer. The Bible says that the Savior must suffer. It's the plan of God. It's the business of our Savior to go and be numbered and carry the sins of the world and suffer and die. That's the business. And it was bound in the heart of our Savior. I must be about my Father's business. I think about our sins, and by the way, that's just some unscripted remembrance that I gave right there. That's not in the notes. And I could give you 500 more examples of my life. And by the way, so could you. So could you. The thought that the business of God is bound in our Savior's life in such a way that He is on point, He is on task. Luke 17, 25 says, Christ must suffer. He must suffer many things. And then it says in Luke 17, 25, that he must be rejected of this generation. I thought about that. I thought about those that, even as a young man growing up thinking, why? Why is it that those people of Israel today, the they would see our Savior walk by the pool of Bethsaida in John chapter 5 and tell the lame man, take up thy bed and walk. The woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8, go and sin no more. The woman at the well in Samaria in John chapter 4, where she miraculously got saved that day. And yet there were others of the city of Samaria that came out to hear the Savior, and they too got saved. The lame man, the man with a withered hand in Mark chapter 1, the lame man of Luke chapter 8 let down through the roof, the maniac of Gadara in Mark chapter 5, cutting himself naked, living amongst the tombs, found in his right mind. Um, maybe the woman with the issue of blood, Mark, um, John, uh, Matthew chapter 12, maybe with the woman with the issue of blood, where maybe it was the centurion's son that the Lord just spoke a word and they were healed. Maybe it was Peter's mother who was found healed by the Savior. I mean, surely all of these evidences of the Savior would lend to the idea that it is believable that maybe we would not reject him but believe him. And yet here we are two millennia later and many are still rejecting him. It's written he must suffer many things. The Lord was the one who said a prophet is not without honor save in his own country. A prophet has extreme value, honor, except for the very people that know him. Matter of fact, many of those in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, Galilee would say something like this. Isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't this just the carpenter's son, the son of the carpenter? Isn't this the little, you know, the little weird guy that ran around all those years? Isn't this the, this is not the son of God. This is not the one. And yet God said it is the business to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ that men would accept him rather than reject him. But the gospel story is that he must suffer and be rejected. Certainly, as the Bible declares in Corinthians chapter two, verses five through nine, that there were those who saw too the death of our wonderful Savior, believing him not to be the Savior of the world. John chapter 3, verse 14, in that wonderful conversation with Nicodemus, he tells Nicodemus, you accept to be born again. You, you can't see the kingdom. And he'll accept to be born again. You cannot enter the kingdom. And like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness and all those that saw live, he said, even so, must even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that all men would look unto him and acknowledge him as the Savior. By the way, if you're here this morning and you're not saved, please understand, look no further than the lifted up Jesus Christ. Amen. By the way, that's what Christmas is about. I must be lifted up. Question for you today, is it bound 
in your heart to lift up Christ? It's not a suggestion. It's binding. It's bound in the heart. The idea that we would acknowledge and, and lift up our Savior, Jesus Christ, that, that all men might acknowledge who he was. John chapter 3, verse 7, he told Nicodemus, ye must be born again. It's bound. It is the plan of God. It's the only way. It's the only binding hard line of God. The only way to be saved is to be born again. Luke chapter 19, we have an example of being born again. You remember Luke 19, right? It was the little short accountant. The Bible calls him a publican. His name was Zacchaeus. Heard the Savior was coming through his town. Climbed up in the sycamore tree. You know the story, right? By the way, he climbed up in the sycamore tree so he could see the Lord. He must have really been short. Climbs up in the sycamore tree. The Lord amongst the press of the crowd, amongst all the people, no doubt there was a caravan. And, I mean, it was like a rock star, if you will, in the day of Christ. When he comes to town, everybody shows up. Walking through the streets, the Lord pauses and looks up and says, Zacchaeus, I must abide at your house today. Among all these people, Zacchaeus, you're the one. I am bound. I must come to your house. You imagine Zacchaeus nearly falling out of the tree. You got to be kidding me. I mean, all these people and all of a sudden he just stops, cold tracks right in the street, looks up in the tree. Zacchaeus, hey bud, I'm talking about you. I must come to your house. But I can imagine Zacchaeus like any of us. I mean, it's like the president showing up. More so, right? I can imagine that kid scurrying out of the tree, working his way through the crowds. Oh my goodness, we don't have anything to eat. House is a mess. Right, ladies? Kids are, who knows what they're doing? You know, runs home and the Lord goes to his house. And, and instantly Zacchaeus is like, Lord, I've stolen money. And, you know, I've given, I've stolen this, but I give this much back. Four times the amount. Oh, oh my goodness. Uh, the impact of the Savior, the impact of the message is that people are changed. Question, is it bound in your heart to change according to the message? Is it bound? Or is it a suggestion? So I'm not sure I really agree with God. I'm not real sure that it's bound, you know. I don't really know the message. Zacchaeus just starts confessing and repenting. He goes exactly the way that he told Nicodemus. Except a man be born again. It's intended for all men to repent. And Zacchaeus repents. And the Lord says in Luke 19, 9, Salvation has come to this house. By the way, the Lord makes it very clear to us in his examples that as bound as the message was in his heart, that the message was intended to be shared. Is that an amen? So let me ask you a question. Who is Zacchaeus in your life? Who is Zacchaeus in your life? Say, Brother Andy, I don't have a Zacchaeus. Well, you need to find a Zacchaeus. We need to find a Zacchaeus. Well, we need to find someone that it is imperative where we feel bound in the heart that I have got to go to your house today. We're not the Savior, but we have the information of the Savior. Amen. And we tell those we're bound. I must be about the Father's business. We finally come to, I think, an important part. Remember John the Baptist? Great prophet. John the Bible says there's never been a prophet like him. He was unbelievable. John shows up, things happen. John shows up, the message is clear. John, I mean, John was a great preacher. He was an impactful prophet. He understood and people responded to the message. And yet John said, he must increase and I must what? decrease. 
Question, is it bound in your heart to decrease in your life so that Christ can increase? That's a challenging thought. What's it take for your life to decrease so the Savior can increase? The final thought, the final thought. Let me give you the reference. My mind doesn't serve me. Luke chapter 12, verse 12. The Holy Spirit will give you, the Holy Spirit will give you what ye ought to say. You with me? The Holy Spirit, if you look at the context, it's very clear. The Holy Spirit will give you what you are bound, what you must say. What are you bound to say? You see, here we are, it's Christmas. It's Christmas season, it's December. We're gonna celebrate the arrival of Christ. And the Lord says, I must be about my Father's business. What is bound in your heart concerning the Father's business? What ought you to say? What must decrease so the Lord can increase? Whose home should you go to today? I'm not talking about necessarily a physical address, although that might be the case. Who is your Zacchaeus that the Lord wants to use you to speak through you, to tell them the Lord is about abiding with you as your Savior? And of sharing the gospel message of a wonderful Savior and a wonderful Father who had a plan to save the world. Can I get an amen on that? What an incredible God we serve. So what are you bound to today? Maybe another way to ask that question is what has you bound up? What has you bound up? By the way, um, so here's my day. Got here at 7.30 this morning and um, several things to do before church. Sunday school, preach. Thank the Lord he didn't have to leave music today. So as soon as church is over, guess what my family's doing? We're going to go find us a Christmas tree. You know why today? It's the only day it works for my schedules for my family. You know why? Because we're bound to everything else. By the way, bound to work, bound to family, bound to grocery shopping, bound to whatever. We're going to go look for a Christmas tree. Hopefully we can get that done in time to be back by 4 o'clock. So if I'm not here, y'all just go on without me. Oh, no, no, no. I'm bound to be here at four. I'm your pastor. I'm bound to be here at four. By the way, I'll be here at four. Maybe with muddy shoes. Maybe with a pine needle or two. I don't know. And then we're going to have our evening service. We're bound to that. We're going to welcome our new families. By the way, for your new family, we are so glad you're here. Matter of fact, what it means to be a new family in our church means we're bound to you and you're bound to us. We're bound to each other. As soon as church is over tonight, I'm going to go visit Jane Walton. That's the appointment time to go see Miss Jane. Sit down with her and talk about Brother Lloyd. Visit with her and try to love on her, try to encourage her. And by the way, she knows where Brother Lloyd's at doesn't replace the void in the heart. There's a hole in the life, right? One has passed on. A husband of many, many years has passed on. What that means is I'll get home tonight about 9 o'clock. And uh, that's my day. And I'm bound to my day. By the way, that's not a sob story. I'm bound to my day and I'm glad to do it. But what are we bound to? You see, Christmas shopping or looking for trees really doesn't tell anybody about the gospel of Christ. What are we bound to today? What are we bound to that maybe is hindering being bound unto the Father's business? Challenge your heart this morning. May the Lord encourage us and challenge us and move us off of our comfort zone. May the Lord impress upon us. Maybe the Lord draw some hard lines. The Lord says, this is what you must do and I don't really care what you think else. 
Maybe that's how the Lord needs to treat us. Or maybe the Lord just says, throws it out there and says, you know what? I've got something so big. I've got a plan that's so large and so big and it's incredible. It is worldwide and I need you to be part of it. How about buying into the business? The question for us again is what does it take to be bound unto the Lord? Father, we thank you, Lord, this morning. Father, for your word, it's our privilege to talk about you. It's our privilege to, to preach. Father, thank you for giving us the example of our Savior. Lord, to understand what it means to be bound to something, what it means to have a must in our life. And Father, we, Father, rather than just being convicted, help us to respond. Help us to open up and accept and believe in and, and live out this being bound to the business. Father, I pray that you'd challenge our hearts today. And Father, whatever that may be that would bind us to something else, Father, help us to be responsive to you. Father, we love you now. Be with this time of response in our heart. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.